Hi everyone, I'm Jeff. Welcome back to Sound and Voltage and this video series on the wonders of frequency modulation. In the last video, we looked at a key bit of magic in FM, how the resulting waveform has all these extra frequencies added to the sound. If you didn't see that one, you should probably check it out because a lot of what we're going to talk about going forward is all based on that. There's a link to the whole playlist in the description. One of the things that we discovered last time was that the quality of sound really depended on the relationship between the modulator and carrier frequencies. There's a whole video on that coming up, but for this one I want to look at a very specific version of it. And actually if you've come from a Yamaha style digital FM synth, you've probably seen diagrams like this that indicate the relationship between the various oscillators in a patch. Each of these possible organizations is called an algorithm, and trust me, we're going to get there eventually. But in these algorithms, you may have seen this. What does this do? It looks like the oscillator is modulating itself, and that's exactly what it's doing. But what does that mean, and why would you want to do it? And if FM adds frequencies to the carrier, what happens when the carrier and the modulator are the same thing? All will be revealed. Actually, before we get to the whole revealing bit, just a quick comment. I've had some comments on the videos about digital versus analog oscillators and phase modulation versus frequency modulation, and I'm kind of blowing that stuff off because I'm trying to stay focused on the basic functionality that pretty much all oscillators demonstrate. I will come back to it though when I dig into the math behind things, but the main thing I want to say here is that every oscillator can be a little different. Digital oscillators can implement FM differently, analog oscillators can have very different circuit designs that handle this sort of modulation differently. I already have a video up on my second channel that shows the behavior of eight different modules. They mostly work the same up to a point, and then stuff goes all over the place. You should 100% get your own oscillator out and try things for yourself. Okay, back to it. To start, let's distinguish this arrangement, self-oscillation, from this one, where the modulator and carrier have the same frequency but are different oscillators. We're going to look at that arrangement when we talk about the relationship between oscillator and carrier frequency next time. A one-to-one -one ratio is important, but this is different. The speed is the same, exactly the same, and they're exactly in phase, which we haven't talked about much yet, but it can certainly have an effect. But well, well, let's take a look and see for ourselves. I've got the Captain Big O here, outputting the always popular 440 hertz sine wave. And it's hidden a little bit here in the cables, but I have the sine output also looped back into the linear FM in, with the modulation turned all the way down for now. Now let's ease up the modulation. Right away we hear the pitch dropping, and we can see it on the tuner. And about here, the sine wave is looking more pointy, while the bottom is stretching out a bit. Deeper oscillation now, where we're pitched down an octave from where we were, and the waveform looks distinctly non-signy, and definitely the sound has evolved to match. Now check out the spectrum. We have frequency components starting at 220 Hz, then 440, 880, 1100. That looks a lot like the spectrum for a 220 Hz sawtooth wave, with every fundamental represented. So that's cool. We took a sine wave, modulated it with itself, and the frequency dropped, and we got perfect harmonics from that frequency on up. And it's no fluke. I'll keep tuning up the modulation, and you can see the pitch drop more. Then the sidebands move with it, maintaining a perfect relationship. And how does it respond if the carrier frequency changes? I have the oscillator hooked up to this keyboard, and as I play a couple of notes, yeah, you can see the sidebands all maintain that perfect harmonic distribution. So the positioning of the sidebands at perfect carrier frequency harmonic intervals isn't too much of a surprise. One thing we saw in the last video is that sidebands occur at intervals of the modulating frequency. But in this case, the modulating frequency is the carrier frequency, so we'd expect to see sidebands appear at intervals of that frequency. Actually, we'd expect to see them on both sides of the carrier. So if we have a carrier at 110 Hz, with sidebands at 220, 330, 440, etc., we'd also expect to see them every 110 Hz going down. So starting at 110, down 110, that's 0 Hz? And then we go negative 110, negative 220, negative 330? What the heck does that mean? What is a 0 Hz wave? 
And what does a negative frequency mean? There's probably two different videos here to answer this question properly, and I'm gonna punt just a little bit, but uh, zero hertz waves are kind of a thing. That's just voltage that doesn't change. If a sine wave is just voltage that wiggles up and down at a certain rate, if that rate is zero, then it's just voltage not wiggling up and down anymore. It just gets turned into an offset, a DC offset, consistent voltage that's just added to the system. Most linear FM has a capacitor on the input that filters that out. And negative frequencies are kind of treated like they're reflected back around that zero point. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this. So that negative 110 hertz sideband actually appears at 110 hertz, overlaying the sideband already there at 110. It's a whole thing, and that zero point at zero hertz, this is what through zero FM refers to. It'd be a 20 minute video if I tried to address all of this here, but I'll be coming back to it for sure. Huh, I keep saying, I'll come back to this. It's seeming like this is gonna be a long series. Anyway, the important result here is that we started with a sine wave at one frequency, we ended up with some funky shark's tooth wave at a lower frequency, and with sidebands perfectly positioned to act as harmonics. And so far I've just sort of accepted the whole drop and pitch thing, but why would it do that? What about this modulation is going to cause the pitch to change like that? Let's look back at pretty much the first demo I did in this series. I had an LFO going slowly, shown here in green, the carrier is in blue, and as I dialed up the modulation, we saw the frequency of the output rising and falling. When the modulator was low, the carrier got lower. When the modulator was high, the carrier got faster. Now in that case, we could hear the frequency change. The modulator was slower than the carrier, and we were able to make out that change in pitch. But now things are going at the exact same rate. So what does going faster mean? Well, it sure seems like the wave is rushing up towards its maximum voltage. And then going slower means that it's taking its time down at its lowest voltages. But if we rush towards the top and slow down towards the bottom, that means we're spending more time going slower than faster. The entire cycle takes longer to complete, and now the pitch is shifted downward. Now at this point, you have no idea how much I want to go all calculus on your collective asses, but I'll have to push that off to yet another video. Maybe on my second channel, since probably only 10 of you care, but it's gonna be pretty darn cool. So that example was using linear FM. What would happen if I tried the exact same test with exponential FM? Is it gonna go crazy? Actually, no, it works basically the same. The only thing is that if I compare the waveform from the linear test with this one, both have been modulated from 440 down to 220, but the resulting waveform is even sharper with exponential. It is rushed up to the top faster, and it's dropped down to the bottom faster. And that's interesting, mostly in how unsurprising it is, just given the meanings of the word linear and exponential. Okay, that's the sine wave. And generally speaking, I'm focusing more on that for this series, just to keep things short and simple, and somewhat tied back to the original paper. But there are other waveforms, of course, and I did some tests with both a triangle wave and a pulse wave. I decided to push both of those off to a second channel video to help maintain focus here, but it's totally worth checking them out. Especially if your own oscillator doesn't have a sine wave output, and you want to follow along with your own experiments, you might want to check out the triangle wave to see how it behaved. There's a link in the description, and that video will probably follow this one in the playlist. Quick result though, triangles are a lot like sine waves anyways. They have sparse, weak harmonics, and when self-modulated, they turned out rather close to what the sine wave did. Pulse waves, on the other hand, do something completely different. They turn into pulse waves, only different? Definitely check out that video if you want to know more. Okay, I think we can call it about here, and let's see what we learned from that demo. First, we learned that self-modulation is a thing. It's really easy to do, and if you're a modular fan and have even a single simple oscillator, this is something you can experiment with right now. Second, we saw that modulation caused the higher voltage parts of the wave to accelerate towards a peak, and the lower voltage parts to dwell longer in the troughs. Because of this, we heard a downward shift in pitch. Further, when we looked at exponential FM, it seemed to do the same thing, just faster. Third, because the modulation frequency is the same as the carrier frequency, we saw the sidebands appearing at multiples of the carrier frequency, which exactly mimic the harmonic sequence. We turned a simple sine wave into something more sonically interesting, and all we had to do was make sure it was pitched right where we wanted it. Fourth, we looked very briefly at the idea of zero and negative frequencies and what that might mean. 
I digressed a tiny bit into the math, which I really want to spend more time on, because I'm a big old geek. For my example here, and in the second channel video, the carrier and the modulator, since they were the same thing, were the same frequency, so there was a ratio of 1 to 1. Next time, we're going to look into why the carrier modulator ratio is important, and what we can intuit about a sound based on the ratio carrier to modulator. This is one of the really important ideas in FM, and it's a bit more math than we've had to do so far, but we're going to learn a ton from it. And that's it for this little digression into self-modulation. I hope you found it helpful, and if you got this far, maybe like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. Thanks for watching.